Hello, party people. Good morning here. It is a nice, beautiful sunrise here in San Diego. Oh, it's just the perfect time. Uh, oh, that's the first time in a while. So we're on the flight line for San Diego Airport. Oh, nice. UPS. Um, it's uh, I get excited when we have big planes again. We, we uh, ever since the coronavirus hit, we haven't had a whole lot of uh, large planes come through. It's been kind of, you know, the tourism's gone downhill, of course. Uh, there's been just less traffic and shipping kind of stuff. All It's been a very different kind of time out here. Uh, Kurt says, my brain still hurts from the last three days of parameter sniffing. What was I sniffing? Yeah, so we just finished uh, Tuesday. I did the fundamentals of parameter sniffing, and then mastering parameter sniffing was Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We had Kurt. We had Christopher, CGS. Good to see you again. Uh, was in in those classes as well. I still have a lot of work to do on the labs on those. I feel like I, I just always want to take it up a notch. And then we got feedback, so I, was, I try to run surveys when I think I might need to tweak something about the lab. I run surveys in the classes to see where the lab's too hard, too easy, uh, or just right. And the mastering parameter sniffing, about one-third of the folks said that it was too hard, and then two-thirds said it was just right. So I've got some work to do there on those labs. I might do those in the next stream or two. We'll see uh, how that's going. And then this morning's topic, uh, well, I got a great email yesterday from a client. The client asked, how do I know if my query is good enough or not to go into production? Oh, you got your power back. Oh, that's good. Uh, how do I know if my query is good enough to go into production? And I was like, oh, that's a great, I love that question uh, because it's something that I kind of have a gut feel as a person, but I don't know that I've ever really put it down into a blog post about what my thought process looks like. So I've started writing the blog post. <laughs> yes, exactly. Alex says it compiles. Uh, and then step two, it actually executes successfully. Three, I am still alive when my query finishes. Mm. So it's like, so how do, I, how do I put that in for new developers? If you're a new developer, because so many people out in the world, their production server is completely different. It has a where clause, <laughs> and it's not where one equals one. The production server and the development server are so different in terms of horsepower. Like maybe the production server is so beefy, and yet their dev servers are really small. Or their production database size is so totally from their development database size. These days, in the day and age of GDPR and HIPAA and PCI and SOX compliance and all that kind of thing, um, oh, good. Very good to hear. Uh, super. They have all these compliance things. Often people are developing with a completely synthetic database that has nothing to do with the database that's out there in production. So this, this led me into going, okay, I can't give this client an answer quickly over email. And it was such a good uh, question. So I'm like, all right, I need to go write a blog post for that. So I've started writing the blog post, but in last week's stream, y'all were very emphatic when I gave you the choice between, would you like me to write the WordPress part of the blog post or just work on doing more demos? You were very emphatic that you wanted to see more demos instead. So I've started writing the blog post, but I'm not gonna go into the WordPress side of it, and I'm just purely going to do uh, the, oh, so SQL Dev DBA, yeah, uh, the demo side of it. So I'll work on the demos and put in my, like start capturing the screenshots for it. And then I'll actually write the blog post separately and it'll run in like two weeks or so. My blog post queue for this coming week is already baked. Just finished doing the, re, uh, the release work for the first responder kit. So the first responder kit, new SP Blitz, Blitz Cache, Blitz Index and all that will go live this morning. Uh, or this afternoon, the, the release will go live on GitHub this afternoon. Hi, folks. Uh, and then the blog post for the new first responder kit and the new consultant toolkit will go live on Monday. And on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm talking about things you can do with the first responder kit. Those blog posts are baked. So this one's really for like two weeks from now. So let's go in and I'll show you the outline and we'll start writing demo queries. <laughs> So these are the things that I thought about when, I, when I'm when i writing the blog post for this person. I said, okay, so, so how do I know if a query is good enough? There is a, there are a list of things that I think about before I ask or answer the question. And those up here, 
I'm not going to dig into in the blog post. All I'm going to do, good morning, Big Mike, all I'm going to do is just kind of give them a list of here are things that I think about, and I'm not going to give you the answers because if you're smart enough to ask the question, you know the impacts that these have for you. You know, there's only so far I'm going to go when writing a blog post in terms of spoon feeding folks. So I'll let y'all read lines three through seven before we start building uh, demo queries. And then now, when I think about measuring queries, I think about these three things. I think about duration, reads, and memory grants. There are other ways that you can uh, measure queries as well. Locks is, a, is a, an interesting one. Are you holding entire table level locks? Or are you just holding row level locks? I'm not going to go into that level of detail in the blog post, though, because I usually try to aim for around 1,000 words, 1,000 to 2,000 words max. And between these three, that's probably going to be a uh, bad idea thong. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, it's probably going to be one to 2,000 words just with these three things here. So duration. I don't usually like measuring clocks or measuring queries in terms of uh, clock runtime, but I want to show the reader how to do it. And to do it, I want to show them a query uh, that's going to take a long time in order to execute and that it's going to burn multiple CPU cores while it works. I think that there's an art to... Um, <laughs> I think there, there's an art to writing demo queries to make them as simple as possible that I can use as few tables as I possibly can and make the query seem real world, make it seem like something that somebody would normally write. I, this is why I hate AdventureWorks and Northwind style queries uh, because they, they're just disconnected from reality. Somebody will write some demo query and they're trying to explain it to you and they're leaping five you know, words in or five sentences in trying to go, oh, look, I didn't, you know, no one would ever write a query like this. I want my queries to look real. So I need a query that's going to go parallel across single threads and it's going to run for a while. So knowing the Stack Overflow database, I want to use as few tables as I can in these queries. So I'm going to say, th th there are a bunch of big tables. I'm going to take the posts table as an example. The post table over at Stack Overflow hosts, holds everyone's uh, questions and answers. So I'm going to say, for example, I want to find the most popular posts for a date range. I'll go use the comments on that date table post, which is kind of funny. We were ta we've talked about uh, several of the interesting things you can find in the Stack Overflow database. So I'm going to use a post table. Just to come up with something, let's say I'm going to say find the most popular posts for a given date range. So let's go see. So to do that... I am going to say, oh, you know what I could also do? I, I also like doing as few demo queries as possible that, that show problems across all of these. The user's table is so small, though. Um, no, yeah, let's stick with the post. All right, so select top 100. Uh, let's actually go top 1,000. Uh, star from DBO post P where P creation date between... Uh, to, oh, we'll do we'll do functions. We'll do functions in the where clause. Uh, so let's say uh, we'll go where p creation date is greater than or equal to 2018.01.01, and p creation date less than or e he's already had a uh, he's already had actually. If you go back through the blog, there's been uh, Clippy's pad posts in the past. 2018.02.01. And then group or uh, order by P score descending. Uh, I'm also going to say where it's questions only and P post type ID equals. Actually, let's do this. Let's do P inner join DBO post types PT on P post type ID equals PT ID and PT type equals question. Okay, so let's see what happens. And I'll, I'll, I'll be fair and I'm going to do 100 rather than 1000. So let's do this. Now in order to, before I run the query, if my goal is to measure duration, I'm going to say set statistics uh, IO and time on. And then I'm going to go run the query.
and I'm going to include actual execution plan. The reason why I'm going to include actual execution plan is I want to teach the readers where they can get times inside the execution plan, even if they don't turn on statistics IO and time on. Um, in newer versions of SQL Server, they include all kinds of additional metrics over in the actual plans. Because from what I've seen, uh, Microsoft support was getting actual plans from people, but the actual plans didn't have enough troubleshooting data for them to solve the answer, to solve for the problems with the query. So they've been gradually pumping more and more stuff into actual plans, including logical reads, times, trace flags, weight statistics. So really, they can just get the plan and figure everything out from there. It also, I think, has to do with probably them tuning Azure as well, because if they're going to have to tune based on the actual plan, they need lots of stuff built straight into that actual plan. Uh, COB had asked, are you getting any blowback from Microsoft from belittling Clippy or all his fans gone? N almost no one at Microsoft likes me at all. <laughs> Little inside thing there. Uh, I burned my bridges there a really long time ago. Uh, Microsoft, especially back when I was in the MVP program, Microsoft let it be known to me more than one time that uh, MVPs do not write negative things about Microsoft. You know, that that is an MVP-like behavior. And I'm like, well, you're the one who gave me the MVP status. I didn't ask for it. So if I'm exhibiting behaviors that isn't like an MVP, I guess there's only one group that can fix that. If I'm not an MVP, maybe you should take it away from me. And they never did. I ended up giving it up for lots of interesting reasons that maybe someday I'll go into, but it still kind of feels a little raw. Uh, let's see here. So uh, <laughs> not the DBA you're looking for. says, we are DBAs. Nobody likes us. So I like this. This query is going to do absolutely beautifully in terms of uh, illustrating how slow the, the query response time is. And I can also say this is why I can't necessarily judge uh, queries by how slow they are in development, because it may be that in production, I have enough RAM to cache this in table, table in its entirety. So I'm just going to make a note in here, uh, things to discuss in the blog post. Uh, in dev, I may not have all the RAM to cache the table. In production, I might, so the runtime may be way lower. Um, index behavior will be the same between, well, will be the same, will be roughly, roughly the same between production and dev, though. Uh, so if I'm getting a table scan in, pro, in dev because there are no workable indexes, then I'm probably going to get one in prod. So the inaccuracies here, inaccuracies, lead me to use this measure instead. So, and I'm not going to wait for that thing to go finish. Uh, although I'm going to show y'all just in terms of the execution plan. If I go into activity monitor, if you want to see like a query that's running a really long time, what kind of status it's in, you can go into activity monitor. And in recent versions of SQL Server, there's this active expensive queries thing here. You can right click on this and go show live execution plan. And it'll show you the plan live, the status where we're at. So this is kind of useful if I want to go in and see how far back we are from finishing the thing. But I'll tell you what, see how it's not displaying anything? This is totally my regular experience with live ex uh, execution plans as well. I have like a one in three shot of getting them to actually work. A good half the time they don't. Um, hi, Meyer. We're not doing open Q&A in this uh, question, though. So uh, if you want to ask, ask that, feel free to search for no lock on my blog. So if you if you uh, if live query stats isn't turning up results, what you can do is oh, and it just finished at the exact same time. I was going to say what you can do is SP Blitz Who, and if you run SP Blitz Who, it'll show you the live query plan for any running query. Just makes it a little more usable. So let's go over here to the query finally finished over here. <laughs> if 
so Richie and Richie uh, and I are dealing with. Well, Richie's mostly dealing with. We had a problem in Constant Care overnight where uh, Richie deployed a new query to production uh, to help y'all get better missing index hints from uh, Constant Care. And it promptly drove our database server CPU to 100%. We have this beautiful graph, we should actually tweet that, of how CPU just goes straight to 100% on our database server overnight. And Richie woke up to all kinds of failure emails. So here, if I go and look at the messages for this, Oh, so that's beautiful. Um, so I'm going to grab a screenshot of this just so that I can use it during the blog post. So here we'll grab this out so that I can show the number of reads. There that goes. Um, then let's see here. Does it also have? Yes. Oh, that's beautiful. So I'm going to go down to this and grab a screenshot of this instead. That's what I really want. So this will show me the time. And that's good. That's perfect. So there we go. We are we are more than human. We are inhumane to our database server, most likely. Okay, so that's good. That gives me that. Now, if I go over and look at the execution plan, it's <laughs> yellow bang. Yellow bang, I gave you way too much memory. Oh, that's so funny. It's such a terrible answer. Uh, so I'm going to grab a screenshot of this for use in writing the blog post. Uh, and of course, there's our, hey, buddy. I see that you're querying my post type ID and creation date. Sure would help if you had an index on post type ID and creation date. Um, so if I if I'm uh, so I said that Microsoft's trying to get more and more stuff inside the execution. That's actually not a bad idea, Chris. That's uh, not a bad idea at all. Uh, so if I want to see how many logical reads that a query did, I don't, I can't see it out here. Like I would, I should be able to see it for the query overall. I do get to see it for individual tables though. Like if I click on the post table and I go over here to IO statistics, I can see uh, across my IOs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab a screenshot. Shoot. No, that's not the screenshot key, you moron. Uh, I'm going to grab a screenshot of that just so that I got that. Do, to do, to do. do. Um, and then number of rows red. I should also, wow, it's interesting that all threads, that didn't go parallel. That's, wait, what? Hold on now. Why would you not go parallel? You didn't go parallel, even though you read what? It ran for 205 seconds and it didn't even go parallel. That's bananas. Why would you do that? Uh, so, wow. Oh, the stats are terrible on it, too. I'm amazed that it didn't go parallel and there's no uh, non parallel plan reason. That's really funny. Okay, so this is kind of amusing. This is just as a side note. So this is, I'm in SQL Server 2019 compat level. I decided that for today's webcast, I wanted to go to 2019 compat level, and I almost never do that. Um, it's, it's true. He's correct. Um, the cost threshold for parallelism is either 5 or 50. Uh, so the estimated subtree cost on this is 8,351. But the estimated subtree cost, or the uh, cost threshold for parallelism on the server, is 50. So you can see up there. I love how y'all think that I don't have pants on. I think that's very amusing. Thanks. Appreciate you wondering what my cost threshold. No, seriously, I actually like when y'all, because sometimes you actually catch me in, and lots of times you catch me in dumb stuff. Uh, but this time, so what I, I wanted to uh, today start using SQL Server 2019 compat mode inside my demos uh, because I just keep seeing behavior with no pants. You know, just where I look at 2019 and going, what the hell is going on in here? Like, why would you run the query that way? So just for laughs, because it's us, this won't be inside the blog post, but just for laughs, because it's us, let's go ahead and switch into Stack Overflow's database compat level 
2017. So I'm just going to drop back over to 2017 and hit OK. I'm going to rerun the exact same query again. First, I'm just going to get the estimated execution plan. I'm going to hit Control L to get the estimated execution plan. So 2017 goes parallel. You see the little racing stripes there on the posts table. I love how Eric Darling calls those racing stripes. Then let's go through and run it again, and let's see how she goes. Now before, as a reminder, she took 200 and some seconds, uh, and I don't expect it to finish instantaneously, because this, this is actually a big query, scanning the entire post table. And I don't have uh, indexes on either creation date or post type ID, so this will this should be taking some time in order to scan. One of the nice things, though, because this query went parallel, if I go in and look at Task Manager, so now you see that's actually kind of good. That's what I want to see is when SQL Server has a lot of 8K pages to read, I want to see that it goes parallel. But of course, the, and this will be in the pudding that the query actually runs faster. Uh, so we'll give it a second to go through and finish there. Do, 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 do. There we go. Check that out. Da, 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 da. 53 seconds. That's fantastic. That's way better than it was before. And if I go down and look at, it's also less execution time too as well. Less CPU time, less elapsed time. That's just fantastic. Again, not going to make it into the blog post just because there's only so much that I want to confuse the readers with. Um, so let's go back over here and pop it back, Stack Overflow back into 2019. Howdy folks, uh, good to see you. Say okay. And then, so that's that query. That showed me duration taking a really long time. Now, uh, and the, the other thing that, uh, that I kind of wanted inside there was I wanted a query that went parallel, though, because I really want to teach the readers uh, what happens when a query goes parallel and it maxes out all of your cores for an extended period of time. Well, it's amusing that on 2019, we don't get parallelism inside there. So I got to write a different query. So how can I write a different query and get SQL Server to go parallel on that? Oh, God, I don't want to. It's so stupid to have to frustrate and frickin' do that. Okay, um, instead of... How could I get... Uh, I can't believe that query didn't go parallel. That's utterly ridiculous and that it ran for three minutes and didn't go parallel. Uh, I was going to say I could use a query hint like disable batch mode, and that's probably going to do it, but real life users would never do that either. Um, let's try adding a join. Let's see whose question it is. We'll say inner join DBO users you on P owner user owner user ID equals you. You really like subqueries, don't you? Because I think you did that the last time I was writing a demo ID. So we'll say you display name uh, P ID as question ID. Well, we'll do we'll put that later in the query. Uh, P title P score. Well, we'll do P score first because it's sorted that way. Uh, P score P title uh, there, you, oops, yeah, yeah, you display name. And let's see if that one's going to go parallel. I'm just going to hit Control L to get the estimated plan just to see if it uh, estimated. Look at y'all. I'm not, no, come on, Mike. You know me better than that. I am not doing max stop equals one. Someone else asked two as well. Y'all, seriously, I'm not stupid. Plus, besides, it went parallel a second ago when I did the 2017 query. Man, give a fellow a break. Okay, so now that I added a join to another query, it's actually going to go parallel. So, and I know that because it, it showed it in the execution plan. Uh, and just to confirm, we are still on 2019 compat level. So now let's see if I go through and run it, how long this little fella takes. Uh, I'm also going to delete my screenshots from the uh, previous one because I don't want to deal with... I only want to have the screenshots that are actually relevant to the blog post I am about to do. Ah, Mike, nice recovery there. Very nice recovery. 
Ah, before, when we were doing the other demos and I was showing you to look for a live running query, I said if you couldn't get it from Activity Monitor, you could also get it from SP Blitz Who. Well, here's an example of that. What I did was I ran SP Blitz Who, and it gives me the query that's running, its query plan, but also its live query plan. I can click on the live query plan, and this isn't animated. It doesn't show you the moving arrows between there. But what I can do is I can hover my mouse over here, and I can look at, say, for example, number of rows read, so that I can go see how many rows we've read out of the entire table. This is really helpful uh, when I'm trying to see if I know that this table has 40 million rows, I can get a rough idea what my progress looks like. So let's come back over here and she finished in 49 seconds. Okay, that's good. Um, now let's see in terms of time, did this thing go parallel? Oh, God. This is a fun, interesting thing to show you in terms of just because you see something on an execution plan that goes parallel doesn't mean it actually went parallel. So what happened here is that we've spent 50 seconds on the clock and we used about 50 seconds worth of CPU time. That's not real parallelism. Real parallelism actually spends more CPU time than there is on the clock. If I have one minute worth of query runtime and I'm spreading it across four cores, I expect to see four minutes worth of CPU time. One minute elapsed on four cores should equal four seconds or four minutes worth of CPU time. And I don't see that here. It's almost one to one, which means that really only one core did any work. This is also not the object of the blog post, but it's fun to see. It's always interesting that I can, I always come up with uh, execution plans that illustrate a problem when I'm trying to show you some other problem. Life of doing a presenter. So I get to file this query away and use it later when I'm trying to illustrate CX packet weights. So what's going on here? So SQL Server did a clustered index scan across the post table, but how was that work actually balanced? Notice that it has Eric Darling's racing stripes there. That doesn't mean that the work actually went parallel. If I right click on that and I go into properties, then I can come up here to see by thread how the work was allocated. In this, all of the threads were given pages so there are four threads here that all did work. There was work spread across all four. Now, how many of them found rows? Oh, ho, ho, ho. Now, this wasn't what I meant to talk, tell you about, but this is so much fun to see, and it's one of my favorite lessons, so we're going to talk about it here for a minute. If I told you... And so in, a, in order to tell the story, uh, we'll go back to how to think like the engine. So the post table is a stack of pieces of paper over there in the closet. It's a whole stack of 8K pieces of paper. And if I told you, hey, you get three of your friends and all of four of you go into the office supply closet and go start scanning the post table. And what I'm looking for is I want each of you to find, Moshiko, we're not, we're not doing open Q&A in this webcast. So in here, I want you to go into that table and I want you to go find posts that match that date range. You're like, okay, all of us are going to go in there, right? We're all going to go in and we're going to start looking at the posts. Select top 1000 star from DBO posts. And so here is how the posts are organized. There, there's an ID column, starts at one and goes up to a bajillion. So they're organized by ID, and you and your three friends are each going to grab a stack of posts. You're going to grab them just by the way that SQL Server chose them. SQL Server decided to give one of you the first quarter of the table, one of you the second quarter of the table, one of you the third quarter, and one of you the fourth quarter in order of IDs. Now... Which one of you do you suppose is going to find posts that were created in one month in the year 2018? Think about that for a second. 
If I hand you out, just to say, let's keep the numbers simple. Let's say that person number one gets IDs one through one million. Oops, <laughs> million. Person number two gets IDs one million one through two million million. And then I'm copy pasting the rest because I'm way too smart for that. Uh, person number three, and then person number four. This person gets two, three, three, four. If all these IDs are in order, and I tell you, find all the rows where, and I'll copy paste the creation date out so that you can see it again. And if these started back in the year 2008 to 2010, and these were like, say, 2011 through 2013, and these were maybe 2013 to 2016, and then these were 2017 through 2019, guess who's going to find all the rows? The work isn't going to be evenly balanced because SQL Server doesn't know that there's a correlation between the IDs and the creation dates. So SQL Dev DBA nails it. Only one of these workers is actually going to find anything to work on. The rest of them will go shuffling through like John Travolta in Pulp Fiction. They won't find any rows. So as a result, all of the rest of the work in there is down to just one thread. This is one of the problems with parallelism in CX packet. So in, in SQL Server, you see CX packet weights whenever the weight isn't evenly balanced across all four threads. So I had <laughs> person five. That's, that's pretty good, actually. Um, so all of those, it's unevenly balanced. As this data flows up through the execution plan, all of the work is still divided by core. So let's come back up here and look at who found the, the work. So when I look up at the number of rows that were found, only thread four found anything. Now all of those rows, all 186,000 rows, are still confined to thread four as we move up. So if I look at this hash match and then I look at the number of rows, there's only one, one uh, thread doing any of this work. Then, if I look at the sort, you would think that the sort work would be evenly divided across the workers, but it ain't. If I click in on here and I go look at that, all of the work was done by thread four. And then also, the sort's memory was evenly divided across all four threads. So a bunch of memory in this query was simply wasted. Three of those threads didn't need any RAM, but thread four did. So if I hover my mouse over here and go look in, we end up spilling to disk. Thread four ended up having to write a whole bunch of pages to disk because we just didn't have enough RAM. Now, same thing up here as we continue to get up. This nested loops join, this index seek, all this work is only being done by one thread. So at the end of the day, this other thread's just sitting, the other three threads are sitting around idle. If I go look in, I'm going to click on the select way over there on the left. Over on the right, I'm going to go into weight stats and I'm going to go look to see what were my top weights for this query. And in this query, we had 50 seconds worth of CX packet weights because those other threads are just sitting around not doing anything, waiting for thread four to get up off his, I was going to say his lazy rear, but he's really the only hard working thread inside this whole query. So this is an interesting fun side note. Change the light balance on this just so that y'all can actually, whoops, nope, that's not it. Change that, da, 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 da. so there we go. 
So, um, a contact administrator. Unfortunately, no. It's just basically luck of the draw. Whichever thread gets the uh, pages that all have the uh, sorting to be done. GE says if all four threads scan their rows, why is only one thread generating all the CPU time? The, the work of reading pages is super simple. You can read millions of pages very quickly. Just do a count star and you'll see how many pages you can read very quickly. But sorting them sucks rocks. Sorting is very CPU intensive and that's why only one thread is really generating all the CPU work. So that's why when I talk in my uh, mastering server tuning class, why I say that whenever you see CX packet weights, your first step is just to set sane default parameters for cost threshold and for max stop. But that really at the end of the day doesn't fix anything. You have to go in and look at your queries to see which ones are reading the most data and then tune them so that they read less. The whole reason that we're in this situation is just because right now we have to scan this whole entire table because we don't know where those rows are going to be found at. If we knew, or like if we had an indexed copy of it, then SQL Server would make different execution plan decisions. So when you see CX packet, don't worry as much about tuning parallelism itself. Worry much more about just finding queries with a lot of reads and go tune them. Um, I also, I find this uh, really amusing because you and I know when I, I wrote out the steps of where are we going to find all the, the posts that were created in that month, you and I can kind of figure that out by looking at the, the rows and their creation dates, like the IDs and their creation dates. But SQL Server has no way of knowing that ID and creation date are kind of tied in lockstep. After all, there's nothing to stop you from going in and updating a post creation date to something else. And if you did, we still have to find it in its earlier or later ID. Just because you know that two columns are tied together kind of in lockstep doesn't mean that SQL Server can guarantee that. So now after all that, knowing what we know so far, if I'm going to do a parallel query, I can't do it based on creation date. Because if it's on creation date, all the work is going to get nailed down to one thread. I could fix that with an index. I could create an index that has creation date, but then the query probably won't need to go parallel either because there isn't going to be that much work to do. So what I need to find instead in my demo query is I need to find something other than creation date that will roughly evenly distribute rows across time. So what I'm going to say instead is tags. At Stack Overflow, questions can have tags. So for example, you can tag something C Sharp, SQL Server, HTML, AWS Aurora, Postgres. Um, so what I'm going to do, and of course those tags would be roughly evenly distributed across time. They wouldn't be if we picked a modern tag like AWS Aurora, something that has only uh, popped up in the last few years. But as long as I pick a tag that should be roughly distributed across time, like SQL Server, that's going to work. So I'm going to have to change my demo query again. I'm going to change my demo query to have where tags like SQL Server or tags equal SQL Server so that I can see the most popular SQL Server tagged questions over time. Now, I know when I do that that I'm going to get questions from people about, you're not catching all the questions tagged SQL Server, and at which point I'm going to refer them to this Twitch uh, screen so that they can go watch this whole entire thing and they can see how hard work it is in order to write blog posts. Now, um, <laughs> A quick shout out to this week's sponsor. So this week's sponsor is brought uh, Quest Software, where they put together an ebook with query tuning tips from me, Panal, Janice. Uh, you can go download that totally free over at brentozar.com slash go slash optimization. Uh, Narrowpack says, off topic question. I saw your schema. 
Were you looking up my pants? Uh, do you refer? Da, 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 da. So the, the problem, oh, hey, Penal, good to see you. Um, the, the problem with uh, normalizing that, like joining out to other tables to get things like score, is when you're a stack overflow scale, when you're dealing with 10, 20, 100,000 queries per second, you can't really join out to other tables and do aggregates for uh, scores, comment, count, etc. It would just take too long. And they don't need to be transactionally accurate. These aren't stock trades, so you don't have to worry about having de precise decimal accuracy on the number of likes that a, that a uh, post has had, for example. Okay, so now let's go back in. Let's change the query so that it uses uh, tags instead. So let's see. Oh, CGS asks, where do the Twitch query bucks go? Well, I dropped out of the Twitch affiliate program because in order to be in the Twitch affiliate program, you're not allowed to live stream on both YouTube and Facebook and Twitch all at the same time. Twitch wants exclusivity. They want to be the only ones hosting your stream. And I'm like, I would rather reach more people because about a third of my audience is on YouTube and about two thirds are on Twitch. I don't want to lose the YouTube people. Facebook, there's like two or three people who watch at any given time is not like a huge number especially given my times so so yeah so I had to drop out of that in the twitch partner program I was in line to be a twitch partner as well and they're like uh, they're kept going they're like are you sure wouldn't you like to just stream on twitch and I'm like eh, not if I'm not allowed to stream anywhere else I'm not you know unless you start paying me like doctor disrespect did I say that out loud I think I did say that out loud um, Bert, Kurt says, my uh, copy of Stack Overflow doesn't have a post type of question. It has a whole lot more question types. Okay, so I'm not going to go off topic here. I, that's kind of going a little off topic there. All right, so let's go change this. And instead of doing an inner join on post types, I'm going to take that out and not do the type on question. Actually, I still could. I still can do that. That's okay. And instead of creation date, I'm going to say where p tags equals, I'm going to say like uh, SQL server. All right. And let's see here. Let's. I'm going to take a, a view at the estimated execution plan on it first, uh, just to make sure that it goes parallel. And it does. Okay, good. Whew. Um, just as a side note, I'm going to go into properties. And you saw that it kind of took SQL Server a few seconds there just to compile the plan. To compile a plan, it took 20 milliseconds worth of CPU, and it took 3.9 seconds worth of time. Isn't that odd? It took 3.9 seconds out of to uh, for time, but only 20 milliseconds worth for CPU. Well, it has to deal with the fact that we just queried on a, a new column that we haven't played around with. Okay, very cool, uh, Crazy Tech. Um, queried on a column that we hadn't queried on before in this database. So SQL Server did an auto update stats. SQL Server did an auto create stats, uh, just did it by sampling the entire table uh, and then uh, used those stats in order to generate the execution plan. So let's try it again. Let's go through and execute the query again. Now remember last time it took 50 some seconds. Uh, and essentially the query went single threaded because only one thread found the work. Things may be a little different this time. So the work's going to be spread across multiple threads, but also there's going to be a hell of a lot more CPU time because this operation right here is extremely CPU intensive. Whenever you want to crack open a string and examine its contents, looking for pieces of something, CPU just absolutely goes through the roof. So if I, to show you what's going on there, is if I say select top 100 star from DBO posts, if I go through and say select top 100 star, howdy Ernesto, um, and then go scroll across to the tags, over here, these are the tags. Any question at Stack Overflow can have up to five tags. So you can tag a question with SQL Server, indexing, performance tuning, triggers. You know, you can tag with up to five different tags. And those of you who are database professionals are probably like itching and screaming with hives because that, that's so frustrating to look at and have to query. 
And you're probably thinking, would Stack Overflow really store their data this way? Yes, that's how it start, got started when, SQL, when Stack Overflow just got started. Late now, these days, they use a different way of doing it in production. But another common question I get all the time is, couldn't I use full text search for this? Well, things like this will absolutely make Stack or uh, full text search blow chunks. Same thing with C Sharp, same thing with .NET 3.5. Full text is just going to blow chunks whenever it tries to hit something like that. So instead, what we have to do right now is we have to do where tags like SQL Server. We have to use that leading percent sign. So good news. So now at least we have our query results. So our query result says, how do I do an update from a select? Oh, I like it. That's pretty cool. How do I add a column with a default value? Very cool. These are good questions. I love, how can I remove duplicate rows? Oh, wow. These are very nice. So now if I go look at messages, because after all, my whole thing here, the whole reason we've been working for the last 40 minutes is that I wanted to build a query on 2019 compat level that would go parallel across multiple threads and actually use more CPU time than clock time. Let's see what we've got. And well, okay. it's not great but it's better than nothing. I was really hoping to see something that would just hammer CPU across multiple threads, and here I don't have that. Here the query took 53 seconds, and it took 72 seconds worth of CPU. But you know what? In terms of writing a blog post, this is good enough for me. I wanted to at least just show the audience when you're measuring time, I want you to measure more than just time on the clock. I also want you to measure how much CPU time you used. Because the high, just because you have a, a query running for 50 seconds doesn't mean that your CPUs are idle the whole time, and you could actually hammer multiples of them the whole time. Okay, good. Let me grab some screenshots here real quick. So let's put this in, move you down just a little so that I can get a good screenshot here. Copy you out. And then look at the execution plan, see if there's anything that I want to tell the... Now I'll just show that. Grab the execution plan there. I also want to show them the time that's in the execution plan. So if I right click in here and go over into query stats, That doesn't even match. That's 134, 135 seconds. This over here said 72 seconds. Now maybe, let me scroll down and see if there's something else. Is there maybe, it's like a hidden gem somewhere? Is it, do I have to like hit up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA, BA, start? So the, <laughs> not the EPA you're looking for. That's, that's quite good. That's true. If you don't like what one of them says, you can use the other one and say that your query is ready for production. <sighs> what the f All right, so let's get the picture of that so that we can put it in the blog post. And then my friends, and I use that term loosely, over at Microsoft can look at that and they can see all the kind of crap that I have to deal with as a presenter because this is ridiculous. Some of this quality of this piece of junk. All right, let's come over here. There we go. Now let's switch over here. It's not SSMS, the SQL Server itself. <laughs> It is so frustrating to me, the quality that we're dealing with in SQL Server these days, the quality has just utterly gone downhill. It's just been this complete dive bomb of patch quality, engine quality, bugs out the wazoo. 
So this week, I just like, I'm just like, okay, let's do it. Microsoft, I'm tired of you just dumping this crap out on production and calling it good. So I'm going to start getting ugly. I'm just going to start as every time I find these things, I'm just going to go blog about them and I'm going to go, I'm not even going to file a bug request. I'm not even calling Microsoft support. You deal with it. Just like you shove this code out the door and you expect us to deal with it. Microsoft, it's on you. Good luck. Here you go. I'm pulling your pants down in public knock yourself out. This is the crap that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis as SQL Server professionals. We have to recover from this stuff when people are trying to figure out why is this query not measuring the metrics that are coming up with the metrics that we would expect it to, and the metrics aren't even close. Daniel says, kind of scary, as I usually use a stats parser. You know what's messed up? I don't know which one's right. I don't know whether statistics time where the actual execution plan, the XML, is actually correct. I have no idea. For me to figure it out, what I would have to do is I would have to run the query and watch the number of cores and how busy they are, and I don't have time for that because I would rather be live streaming and hanging out with y'all anyway. <laughs> sad, sad but true. All right. So I think that that's amusing enough uh, and that I am going to keep it inside there because this is educational for the users to go, here's the metrics that I want you to look at. But unfortunately, I have no idea which metrics are right or wrong. And of course, Microsoft is going to see that. They're then going to go fix it, cumulative, several cumulative updates from now. They're not going to post anything about how those numbers are wrong. It's not going to be in prior cumulative updates. Um, Alex says, I saw an oper a predicate in an actual plan, a, a, a prospect type. Uh, yeah, I can't, uh, that's kind of off topic there. All right. So I'm happy with that first one. That gives me enough. I may take that actual execution plan. I'm going to take that actual execution plan and I'm going to put it on paste the plan just because I know somebody's going to want to see that or they're going to want to use a database. Microsoft is going to blame operator error when it's clearly on here on a webcast anyway. That's how my life rolls. Um, so I will right click in here and say, show me the XML. I'll copy paste this out. I will go over to my friend, paste the plan, paste the plan.com and then paste. And it's off by two X. It's not like it's even close. It's, it's like my answers were in college. Uh, so I'm going to just dump that link in here. So actual plan for first demo, paste that in. That, that was hilarious to me. Microsoft buying TikTok. The number of years that they have tried to put something together in the social space, I'm just going to just vaguely, Microsoft Passport for centralized logins. Consumers are just going to use this one login. Everything's going to be cool. Hotmail, oh, it's going to be dominant. Everybody's going to use it. God, stuff is just absolute junk. I get more problems with spam uh, complaints from Hotmail users who say they can't get our newsletters or whatever because of spam from, you could TikTok with my SQL Server rants. And I'll try to make them danceable. Zoom, Mixer, they just gave up on. They put tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, exactly, hundreds of millions of dollars in a mixer paying out people like Ninja and all that. Unreal. Uh, Toby, no. Be, uh, no. Short answer, no. Because that is the point with the statistics time and the execution plans. They both measure multi-core usage. They're just measuring them differently, which is against the rules. Okay, so I'm happy with that. Um, that's a good first demo query. Now, and uh, let's come back up to our Skype. Yes, yeah, another one. Absolutely. Uh, so then the next one that I end up measuring instead, and I'm actually going to talk about that in the blog post, that time is so unreliable when I'm dealing with queries. Time is so unreliable and so changing between dev and production versions that I tend to not measure by that. And what I usually tend to do instead is reads. Um, so uh, in here, I wanted to also have proof that reads alone are not that big of a deal. The SQL Server is crazy fast at reading large numbers of rows. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back over to my, uh, that's not where I wanted to go, go back over to my stats results. So here we did like, and I really wish that they would put commas in there, but evidently that's too hard for Microsoft, a multi-billion dollar company to put commas inside there. Um, it's doing 11 million logical reads. So what I'm going to do is instead of putting any, I'm going to take the exact same query and I'm going to do 11 million logical reads, but I'm not going to do anything with the data. So right now it's taking 
depending on which number you look at, 72 to 130 uh, seconds worth of CPU time. The CPU time is all crunched on this order and shredding of the strings in where <laughs> it will become, yeah, it'll become a chameleon, right? <laughs> Um, so let's go take this exact same query, and I'm going to do it with reads, just doing no select top 100. Instead, I'm just going to do count star, and I'm not going to do any filtering or ordering. I'm going to say just go get everything and go. Now remember, before, this has taken like 50, 60 seconds of clock time in order to run. Watch what happens when I rip the filters out so I'm not shredding strings, and I rip the order by out. Three, two, one, go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. I was hoping it'd be a lot faster. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. Do you know the reason why it's, oh, it's taking so long because it's got to do the joins. Because join, in order to do the joins, it's going to have to sort because I don't have these sorted by post type ID and by users. <laughs> Let's try this one more time. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. You're right. You're probably right. That's probably what it is. Where did my laughter button go? I had a laughter button. Oh, there it is. Okay. What is going on here? Okay, so I have a pretty good idea. I have a pretty good idea that it's a 2019 regression. So after this finishes, we're going to switch over from 2019 compat level and switch over to 2017 compat level and see how long it takes. Okay, so 54 seconds, 54 seconds, and then Richie, <laughs> that's absolutely true. Uh, so 54 seconds, oh, you SQL server, there are no words. Um, okay, so what's happening here? So if I go in and, no, it's not doing that, it's not doing that. So what it's doing here is it's going parallel, says it's going parallel across multiple cores. If I hover my mouse over here, it's doing batch mode execution. So if I get in on here, batch mode execution up there. So it says actual execution mode is batch mode. And I'm going to go across here and look at the other operators in the plan. This is also in batch mode as well. If I come all the way back over here to parallelism, finally in here it goes uh, parallel or it goes back to row mode at some point. Looks like it goes into row mode here when it does the parallelism thing. It didn't actually really go parallel. The amount of CPU time here is lower than clock time, which means that really one thread did all of the work. But of course, given the comical thing that we saw just a second ago in query time stats, I want to double check that and look at that. <laughs> Look at that ridiculous thing. So CPU time here being 88 seconds, whereas it showed like 50 seconds in on uh, stats time uh, on. So those two numbers don't even come close to agreeing now. Just as a reminder, over here is 56, uh, 50, uh, 50 seconds. Now let's pop it back over into 2017 compat mode. Let's go into 2017 compat mode and say OK. Then let's try the exact same query again. Now, as a reminder, in 2019 compat mode, it took 50 seconds. Let's try 2017 compat mode and give it a shot. 10, 9, 8, 7, Why would you? 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, you would think. 1. You would think. 
Uh, oh, I should look and see too. Uh, another way that you can kind of tell the parallelism is happening is if CPU is cranking out at 100% across. Here it's not. Uh, we're not doing 100% CPU across all the cores. Uh, Toby plus plus. If you saw if you saw the query running for 1.6 seconds, you have a different concept of time than I did. Now look at how CPU time's chugging. So now it's because different phases of the query are doing different things: the reading the pages, the aggregating the data. This though is bananas. Uh, I am stunned that this has taken as long as it is. And I don't know if this is a regression in. Uh, 2019. I think I'm still on CU5, 4053. Um, so this thing, geez, it should not be taken anywhere near this long. See, Chris says we're seeing Grumpy Brent today. It seems like it's, well, you saw me yesterday too on the mastering parameter sniffing thing. I lost my mind a couple of times over there. So I'm really surprised that this would take as long as it does to count 40 million rows. Uh, that's kind of a bummer. Um, and it is doing about that number of logical reads. Um, so let's do this. Instead of doing a count, I'm going to do, uh, yeah, Neil, you're right. I got to stop running SQL Server on 8-track cassette tapes. Yeah, that's a good point there. Really smart. Um, so uh, uh, drop table employees, I'll let you do that. Instead, what I'm going to do is I am going to go say, I'm going to go pull a, an attribute that shouldn't be true. I'm going to say where view count is a negative number, constricting my thoughts. Uh, so let's say select star from posts where view count is uh, negative 1 million uh, and try that. So this should also read all of those pages. And I just picked the view count number as a pure random number. So this is starting to become a better gauge of uh, how fast SQL Server can read data without aggregating it. Because with the count star, I'm still aggregating that data. So now I should look to its CPU to see how that CPU is doing. CPU is still not at 100%. Oh, is it going single-threaded? SQL Server 2019, you suck. No, it's going parallel, my butt. So it says it's going parallel. Uh, let's go through and read. Well, let's do a live execution plan this time. Number, oh, won't show number of rows red while it's executing. Hey, see, at least that's what I want to see. Um, so here I've got uh, CPUs churn right around like to 100%. Uh, Galambunga, I went through that earlier, so I'm not going to go back over to that. Um, Jimbo, yes, I'm still on 2017 compat mode. So this is what I want to see, is I want to see CPU running at 100% while I'm running that query. And the thing finished in 30 seconds, which is much closer to realistic. So here, uh, Mon, Manny, that's what I was, that's what the blog post is about that we're watching. So if you uh, maybe pay attention instead of asking questions, you'll have the answer you're looking for. Maybe not. Um, so now it was able to do that 11 million logical reads. It did it in, pull the thing off in 30. That's just a lie. That's just flat out not true. So it's saying that the query ran for 30 seconds and it did 45 seconds worth of CPU. That is simply not true and you can see it. I'll show you. If that was true, then we would only be maxing out one core plus a half, really, for the span of the 30 seconds that this runs. And that's not the case. If I click Query Include Live, execu uh, live Query Stats, turn that back off. Let's go throw Task Manager on and I want you to be able to see that Task Manager is essentially sitting idle here here at the start of this. Then when I run it, three, two, one, go, watch the CPU. Now in the beginning, it is only using one core, basically. If you watch that top left, he's really only doing stuff across one. And then at some point in here, it hits 100% across all four. That's really weird. Because it should immediately divide these threads off across all of the cores. Uh, howdy, Rodman. 
Um, you're not my best friend from Boca, though. I got uh, an even better friend in Boca, Steve, <laughs> Steve Farina. Now, look at how the CPU all of a sudden goes up across the board. All of a sudden, the CPU goes to 100%. What the hell was it doing earlier? And now CPU is just banging. Now CPU is just banging across all four cores. Now, look at that. And the query... Um, Contact, you're welcome to. You can go ahead and do that. That's why I use open source stuff, so that you can go and reproduce these same tricks. So you see how that's going? It went parallel for a brief time span across all four cores. Now if I go back over to messages, that might actually be right, because it went single-threaded for so long. It's just amazing to me that the same query at again and again is having such dramatic different behavior. I'm going to go execute it again and watch my task manager. So one time it took 30 seconds. This time, we'll watch the CPU. Um, I like how y'all just yell out random stuff. I like how you just yell random. Maybe there's a memory leak. You should change your blinker fluid. Have you had enough bananas for breakfast? Maybe you should try a banana now. You look low on potassium. <laughs> are you wearing galoshes? Y'all are like off by one error. So yes, yeah. You put the thing in reverse and then start. Look how it goes. So it goes to 100% all of a sudden out of nowhere. So it takes forever. It takes its leisurely time and then goes to 100%. This is one of those cases where if I was Paul White and I knew how to use a debugger, I would probably lose my entire afternoon trying to understand why, nope, x shibboleth, I'm getting physical reads every time because the, the table's larger than in memory. So, um, so yeah, look, and so now I'm back up to 54 seconds again. That's just utterly bananas. <sighs> things I am not going to investigate today. We are going to close that one and move on. So it has been a little while, so I am going to stop there for that demo. I've had about enough of that freaking demo. Um, so, oh, that's the wrong thing. Hold on, let me switch to something else. That's I have one a chat window that I use for Slack. Um, Tigris, you're welcome to do that. I'm not going to do that uh, to try donuts. Yeah. Um, so it was Jambo says it was 24 seconds at 100% CPU. Shouldn't it be way higher than 54 seconds? Yes. Those stats times numbers are clearly wrong. And, you know, this is always the tough thing with doing live demos. And I can show you that clearly the stuff inside the execution plan is wrong. Stats IO is wrong. But what am I going to do with that? Am I going to open up a bug report? No, I don't. This is my own free time where I'm trying to just like write a blog post and show y'all stuff. I don't mean to find errors like that inside the product. <sighs> There's only so far that I will go in terms of putting in bug reports on stuff like that. Now, I am going to put in a bug report on the stats time IO and the time in the execution plans not matching. To do that, the first step in submitting a bug report to Microsoft is that I need to go check to see whether or not a bug report has already been filed. So to do that, I am going to put in a wait for Jesus. Um, so to do that, I am going to uh, do use Google search because the search on feedback.azure.com kind of sucks. So the first step in doing any kind of blog or any kind of bug report is that I need to uh, be able to, to describe it in a way that I think other people are going to describe it. So the way that I would describe this is that statistics time and then the time in the query don't seem to match. So if I go over to query time stats, so, and I'm only going to do elapsed time, or, or uh, I'm only going to do CPU time. I'm not going to do elapsed time. Although, does elapsed time, elapsed time doesn't even match. Um, that's messed up. Uh, so, let's go see. So, the terms that I'm going to look for are elapsed time. So, over here under query time stats, I am going to pull that elapsed time. I'm going to look for the words elapsed time in the bug reports. So in the bug reports, we're going to go to feedback.azure.com. Oops, that's not it. Feedback.azure.com. Then I'm going to do a search for CPU time and elapsed time, because those are the two words. 
SQL Server 2005 causes 100% CPU by lazy writer. Well, that's really relevant. So that's the only bug. Okay, that's the only bug that, that pops up inside Microsoft Search. I always want to be careful, though, because sometimes their search kind of blows. So I'm going to say CPU time elapsed time site feedback.azure.com. Uh, and see, notice that we get something different in here, but it's just because micro, or, uh, Google's a little bit smarter about breaking up those words. Um, last run say zero fixed reads. Um, so I'm not going to go into that. I appreciate that y'all want to ask other questions, and that's cool, but I'm not going to go there. You're welcome to go in and look at other things. Um, so let's see here. If I go in just to see, to consider the DB pricing tiers. Nope, doesn't look like any of those are relevant. All right, so I need to suggest an ID or suggest an answer, brento at brentozar.com. It's going to ask me for my password. Let me go get my little, hi, Bala, thank you, and welcome to the club. I'm going to switch uh, screens for a second here just while I go grab my password for live. Live, and grab that password, copy-paste that in because I use a password manager because I'm a wonderful human being. And now let's come back over here to this. So now I am signed in, thanks to the magic of that. Uh, actual plans, CPU time, and elapsed. Thank you, Greg. Elapsed time do not match statistics time on. Uh, do, 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 do. Set. There we go. Uh, now we'll scroll down just to see if sometimes the, the autocomplete or the guesses actually match the something that was already filed. And I'm scrolling down and nothing in here usually seem or nothing in here seems like it matches. Uh, to do do do. Uh, no, it's really close. Incorrect number of rows returned. That's kind of funny. Uh, da, 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 da. That's a, that's a bug that I was, um, bug that went away when I was talking about live query stats. Uh, to -do -to -do. They don't put stuff in yellow. That's uh, Google. That's Google's uh, search there. Uh, or my control F, one of the two, I would hope. Maybe not. Maybe they do. Maybe you're right. No, you're, you're right. They do. That's really messed up. All right, so let's post a new idea. Category is bugs. Uh, when... I do a long running query. The uh, time from uh, set statistics time on does not match the actual execution plan. And I'm going to put in the, we'll zoom in a little here so y'all can see it, the CPU and elapsed time. Um, for example, in this live stream, and let's go get it from uh, the live stream, twitter.com. They'll love that. Microsoft loves it when you live stream bugs. Uh, copy that link. Let's see here. Copy. Go over here. Nope, don't put it in. Copy and close and close. And then come back over here. For example, in this live stream, um, I ran this query, and we'll go do one just to go grab it. Uh, so let's see here. Select count star from DBO posts, uh, and then turn the actual plan on. And I also need set stats on, set statistics time IO on. I'll do a, sh I was going to say I'll do a short one, but yeah, no, screw it. I actually should do a long one. Um, so I ran this query from the Stack Overflow database from one of the large Stack Overflow databases. Select star from, and that one's in, that one's in feedback.azure.com. Uh, or select count star from DBO posts, from DBO posts. The actual plan, the statistics, I O or time, time output. So we'll go get the statistics time output out of there when that finishes. 
So, and this is how you post uh, bug reports over at Microsoft. If it's an urgent bug report, if it's something that's stopping you from solving a production problem, then you can pay 500 bucks. I think it's 500 bucks. It's, it's been years since I've actually done it. Uh, but you can call Microsoft's customer support and open a case for like 500 bucks. And if it turns out to be a bug, then they will refund your money. Uh, I didn't say that they would fix the bug. I just said that they would refund your money. Let's go get the execution plan. I'm going to show the execution plans XML, copy that out, and then paste that over at paste the plan, paste a new plan, paste, submit. And then there's my new link. And then so the actual plan is here. And there we go. Oh, I can attach the file too, can't I? Oh, that's even better. Uh, so let's attach the actual plan just so that they can't. Um, so desktop, uh, this will surely not be marked as closed by design. And then I'll go attach that back up, attach a file. I don't know that I put that on the desktop. I'm really bad with putting files. Okay, there we go, perfect. SQL plan, post idea. Please work, please work, please work. This is how they make sure their bug count goes down. They just don't let you file bugs. I have a guess. I just don't know that. But I have a guess that it's probably that file. So let's remove the file and then say post, post idea. Your idea is being processed and will appear shortly. Ah, woo! So here, uh, the new bug report, I'll put that out in chat so that y'all can then go see that. Um, and there's that. Uh, file name was too long, it could be a different, you need to post under a different name. That's actually really good. <sighs> I could live with a lot less of that in my life. All right. All right. So that is probably a good time for us to stop and do a bio break. So this is really not where I wanted to go with is my query. Wasn't, you know what my topic was, remember? My, ter my topic was how do I know if my query is good enough for production, is like ready for production? I think what we've learned is that we've learned some things about SQL Server and its quality of being ready for production. But I digress. Uh, Alex says, as a data person for a Microsoft business, I don't always have to pay for my support cases. I try to insist that they at least take some action, like updating support docs. I agree. I would love for them to um, to uh, at least say in CUs and knowledge base articles, things like that, that yes, this is a known bug and the thing is broken or whatever. Um, so we'll stop here and take a bio break. We'll take a five minute bio break. And when we come back, we'll shift gears into open questions. So over on Twitch, you can ask any questions that you want. I won't do questions from YouTube only because it's easier in Twitch. I can just accept questions as uh, and put them into my queue. So in Twitch, uh, you can uh, ask questions, ask whatever you want, and then I'll go put them into a queue, and then I'll go through and just answer them in order. So we'll be back in five minutes. Go take a bio break, and off we go. Where the hell is the pause button? There it is. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. So short out, shout out to uh, Aid DBA and to Oleg for being the last couple of uh, folks to join in in the club. If you like what you're seeing, I don't know why on earth you would like what you're seeing. Um, it's funny when I when I do this stuff. I don't do this to get rich or be famous or anything like that. I, I literally just do it because I would be here working regardless, and it's more fun working with y'all than it is working by myself. Um, usually I, on weekends between like 6 a.m. and 8 a.m., I will go and write blog posts or set scripts up, write new training material, whatever, uh, just before Erica wakes up. Erica usually wakes up around 9 nine thirty, somewhere inside there. Uh, so the weekend mornings are like my time. I get to do whatever I want to do because you're already rich and famous. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, it's before my, my coffee shop wakes up and the coffee shop wakes up at eight. I've actually had a half of a lox and bagel this morning. Uh, we had, we bought two of them yesterday and we had, um, uh, one half left over, so I had that this morning for breakfast. I am still trying to make a game time decision about whether or not I go downstairs. Uh, helmet is not back up yet. I got a phone call uh, this week, and I finally finished the pizza. Thank God, Chris. Uh, I got a phone call this week from Musicar, the people who have Helmet. I'll show you Helmet. So Helmet is uh, over and in Musicar in Portland. So let's see here, Musicar Portland Flickr, uh, and they have. Let's see here. So you remember Flickr, the old photo site, you know, kind of like MySpace for photos. Um, but this is where they post photos of the builds that are ongoing. And so when when Helmet showed up, so there he is. Uh, they pulled Helmet into the shop and they're working on him. They like put all kinds of protective stuff all over the car so that when they're uh, putting things in and disassembling it, that they don't uh, break things and screw things up. Um, and then the, let's see, come down past the Volkswagen. So that was the truck that he came in on. Uh, and then this was the stereo gear and the radar and laser gear that they were supposed to put into him. And then they decided, they sent me a phone call, or a phone called me. They were like, hey, email me first. Hey, can you uh, get on a phone call real quick? And they're like, we're getting ready to do a brand new series of audio gear for the Porsche 911. Would you be interested in being like the prototype person? where it's our best and newest stereo equipment that's going into there. And I was like, yes, I would. Yes, please sign me up. Um, so that's where he is. I said they, it was totally okay if they spent more time there. Hi, uh, Nunu Bunny or Nunu Bunny, Nunu Bunny. Um, so I'm like, yeah, take your time with him. Take all the time you want. Because uh, also my wheels are uh, are still on the way from Rotiform. So I bought brand new wheels for him. And this almost kind of kills me. He's going to be in storage in a few months. F five to six months. Five to six months. Our lease is up the end of this year, but we're going to do another month to month here in San Diego until I think we fly out to Iceland at the beginning of March. I don't remember the exact dates, but it is coming really fast, uh, really, really fast. And Erica and I were just talking last night about like, where should we move after this? Uh, so we were sitting out having my ties in August, sitting out in t-shirts and shorts. And we we're like, so where do we live after this? Where do we want to live next? Because we've rented for like 15 years and we enjoy renting because it lets us jump around and see different parts of the U.S. And uh, I, she decided she, she wants to stay here too. She wants to stay in San Diego. Uh, we had kicked around the idea of moving to either LA or Malibu or Colorado to like a ski town in Colorado. Um, Bobby Table, so it's interesting. The, the question isn't whether you can fly. The question is, can you get in? Because there are flights to Iceland, for example, but the bigger problem is, are they gonna let US citizens in? Right now, they do if you pass a quarantine test. You have to, to pass a test when you get to the airport. They, they give you a coronavirus test right then and there. The results take three to five hours. Did you hear that, Richie? Three to five hours. Their tests are done in three to five hours. Uh, so then you take that, and then you get another test. And I forget if it's five days, six days, or seven days, what it is. Um, you get another test there uh, there afterwards just to double check that you're not uh, not contagious or whatever. 
Uh, so, but what I worry is because, of course, America is going to have all kinds of outbreaks between now and when we get over there. I worry that they're going to lock the country down before it's time for uh, to, uh, us to get back over there. That's the part that I'm panicked about. Uh, but oh, so helmets, wheels. I'm so excited. Uh, the wheels I ordered, I don't know why I'm showing y'all this. <laughs> I don't know if y'all even really care, but of course, because I'm a car person, I care a lot. Uh, Rotiform VCEs. So these are the wheels that Helmet is getting. Uh, come over here to Rotiforms. Camaro says, of course, Camaro says yes. Um, so he's getting a set of black Rotiform VCEs. Those have wheels on it or have a writing on it from Antisocial Social Club. Mine don't. I didn't have, I don't want any writing, any anything inside there. Not even the name Rotiform. I just wanted pure flat black because everything on him is flat black. Um, so I was all excited because it's like an OZ racing wheel kind of thing. And I ordered these two months ago because you have to do them all custom. They're made just for your car. I ordered these two months ago. And then Ken Block comes out with a partnership this week. Ken Block Rotiform. He is doing his own wheels for Rotiform. Um, and they look amazing. They look really good. And at first I was like, oh man, I really, I would have loved some of his new wheels that he's doing with Rotiform. And then I look over in the corner at the white ones and I'm like, wait a minute, what's that? What's that wheel right there? And then I zoom in on it and I'm gonna mute this just so that I don't get in trouble for the copyright police. And I'm gonna go into one of his wheels and I'm like, wait a minute, that's my wheel. That's the, oh, that's the Rotiform VCE, but they let him do his own version. So this is by Rotiform, Rotiform Motorsports. That's the same wheel I was getting, except mine is just flat. Otherwise, it's exactly the same, and mine's black. But I was like, oh, I could have had Ken Block's wheels. So now I got to go call him and see, hey, if mine aren't manufactured yet. But these aren't actually out until fall, so... I'm, I'm kind of like, Arr. but at least I, I have something that looks kind of similar. So I'm kind of happy with that. We'll see how it goes. Uh, Matt's Valiant says, I'm still jelly. He says, I'm uh, still rolling around in a 14-year-old Scion XA. So the, the thing is, never, my, my whole feeling on cars, you should only pay cash for cars. Ca cars are things that depreciate. Cars, the value goes down. You only want to buy things, you only want to, to ever pay credit for things that might appreciate, that might go up in value. Houses, for example. I'm okay with you know, doing a mortgage for a house. That makes perfect sense. Your house will eventually go up in time. Of course, you're also building ownership in it. It costs an insane amount of money. But you shouldn't uh, pay credit for a car if you can avoid it. You're doing exactly the right thing rolling around in a 14-year-old Scion. I rolled around in old cars for the longest time, too. And the, the only reason that we bought the Porsche was we hit it at a point in our lives where we could pay cash for it. And I was like, all right, let's do it. Um, Kurt says, what about 0% financing? If you don't have the cash, though, you shouldn't be buying it. You should you buy, have a car that isn't going to have you in debt in the future, especially in these trying times, like you have no idea what's going on with uh, the economy, who's going to get laid off for things, uh, whose business is going to get, uh, get imploded. Um, Richie and I are extremely lucky, touch wood, that are, we're still doing really well, but like we were paranoid about uh, buying or spending anything. Always Pink says, I'm still rolling around in a 99 uh, Toyota. Good. That is exactly what you should do. That is fantastic. Um, and Pudota says if you have enough money to pay for a lease, you can save them a bit to buy a car. And it, the problem is people who lease generally want something that is uh, zero maintenance that they know. Like I want to have my wife in a car that I know is going to be under warranty, that it's going to be 24-7 working, and that if something does uh, blow it up in it, she has a factory loaner, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm not as worried about that. You say that, Camaro 322, the new ones don't. Like the new ones, unless you get something limited edition like a Speedster or a GT3, uh, then, then the price actually goes up. But I know mine from the moment that I drove it off the lot. Like if I had to go sell it today, I'd lose 20, 30, 40 grand. But you, you got to be okay with that if you're going to go buy a car like that because it's a, a, a treating yourself lifestyle kind of thing. Like I waited my whole life to be able to buy a 911. I've wanted one since I was little. I'm 
still trying to find my childhood pictures. I used to make model cars, and I'm hoping that I have a picture of one of the models that I built. Of I used to build Porsche 911 convertibles, Corvettes, all that kind of thing. Um, Curious Drive says, what do you think of leasing cars? If I, <laughs> Matt's Valley, uh, if I was in a family, if I had a family and kids and all that, I would 100% lease uh, if I wanted a bulletproof car that would not break, that wouldn't, uh, that if Erica was on a rainy road in the middle of the night, that she could drive safely and not have to worry about it. So I would be okay with that, with leasing on that. The problem that I see is so many people lease luxury cars that they wouldn't ordinarily be able to afford. And if you're watching this and you're one of those people, that's okay. It's just that you're kind of flushing your money down the drain. And it, a friend of mine used to do that. And I, the best advice I could ever give to him is I said, look, with the money that we make, you can only do one of th two things. You can either look rich or you can be rich, but you can't do both. With the money that we make, you can't both be rich and look rich. Sure, Jeff Bezos can both be rich and look rich. You know, the guy can have yachts, uh, uh, Larry Ellison, you know, those people can both look rich and be rich. But for the rest of us, it's you got to make a choice between one of the two. So, uh, <laughs> it's made by Tonka, that's nice. Um, uh, Sabishnav says, isn't leasing almost always more expensive than paying cash? Depends on the car that you're buying. So like with my Porsche 911, you're talking like 150,000 bucks out the door to go buy it in cash. You could lease it for like 1500 a month. So if your goal was to just have it for two years and then walk away from it and go get something else, you'd be way cheaper off leasing. Um, Marathon, I didn't actually, I dropped out of the affiliate program because if you want to live stream in both YouTube and Facebook and Twitch, you're not allowed to be an affiliate or a partner. So I dropped out of that. Uh, and there was another one that was uh, interesting in there. Let me scroll back. Um, oh, Darren Davis said, if you wanted a Porsche for that long, it must have been tough to pick which one to buy. No, I've always wanted a 911 Targa. That was exact. I wanted a 911 Targa. That was the only model that I've ever wanted. Just all about it. Um, and then there was another uh, coming back up. There was another one that was interesting in it. Now I've lost it. It's gone up past that. Ah, uh, well. Okay, uh, so no, G uh, Jesus, you're welcome to ask questions, but I'm not going to do any more uh, coding today. I'm done coding for the day. Today I get to go goof off. I have a client on Monday. I have a client on Monday, and then I teach Mastering Query Tuning. I don't know how many of y'all are in my Mastering Query Tuning class, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That's actually my favorite class out of all the ones that I teach. One of the students this week in Mastering Parameter Sniffing said it's also one of the most... Hi, Mr. Stefan, welcome to the club. Um, uh, said it is uh, also the hardest class, and I think that's probably true, but I, I kind of like it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, marathon, yes, I do. I absolutely do. They were in Sweden, I think, uh, or flew out there. I remember that, absolutely. Um, and then Sid says, 911 Targa, you must be a Porsche fanatic. I'm really just a car fanatic. I love all cars, just all kinds of cars. Oh, that's funny. Oh, very cool. It's a small world. It's neat to see the number of people who I've been able to meet uh, all around the world just being from the traveling things. Not that we can do it anymore, but, you know, it was fun uh, while it lasted. And I'm at the, uh, those of y'all who read my personal blog over at ozar.me, um, you may have read the latest post this month. I'm going to see and try if I can go the rest of my career without traveling. I'm going to see if I can go the rest of the uh, tour or rest of my career and just go ahead and retire without traveling again for either client work or for a conference. So make it rain again. Ah, ha, ha. Um, yeah, no more rain because I dropped out of the affiliate, the Twitch affiliate and partner programs just because I wanted to be able to live stream across both YouTube and Facebook. If you're going to be an affiliate or partner at Twitch, you make money from things like subscriptions and ads and all that. To give you a rough idea, I was making about 250 bucks a month on Twitch. But the catch is you can't live stream across multiple platforms. And because I'm really doing this to reach as many more of y'all as I can, then it made more sense for me to give up the 250 bucks a month and then focus on reaching more of you on Facebook, YouTube, all that kind of thing. 
Uh, Aina says, do you have any recently starting class? Yes, Tuesday. Tuesday I start mastering query tuning. So if you go to brentozar.com and click training up at the top, the next one's mastering query tuning starts this Tuesday. GE says he likes the DBAs with the cars that go boom. That's where he's in. That's why uh, Helmet is in Portland too, is getting a new stereo put in it that I'm very excited about. Um, Marathon has a good question. Why would I go to the training when I got the stream? Because the streams are so short. And so we go into way more detail about SQL Server internals inside the classes. That's kind of my, my thing with the streaming is that just I'd rather give people the short, easy stuff, but it's not necessarily in a an organized table of contents kind of way. It just kind of scatters around, uh, whatever. I am too as well. I will take five minute and 10 minute videos all day long. Like the, when I'm learning, you know, it's really our, I can't watch recorded videos. It just does nothing for me. It's bananas. Um, yeah, and the Twitch streamer thing in terms of money, a lot of it is uh, outside sponsorship too. You know, you can make decent money at Twitch, but you can really make good money when you do uh, ads and streaming. Speaking of which, let's give a quick shout out to this week's sponsor. <laughs> This week's sponsor is Quest Software. Quest is uh, giving out a totally free ebook on query optimization. So you can go get that over at brentozar.com slash go slash optimization, where you get tips from me, Pinal, and Janice. I haven't actually read it still. I hope that it's good, and I hope they didn't screw things up. But I really should read that today. And I'm, I'm kind of uh, going to, I should probably do that today. Marathon, that's funny. And I haven't been out there. I, I remember talking to a couple of folks from over there know, a year or two ago about coming out. We couldn't make the, the time work. Uh, Jesus says, uh, I'm never going to pay for learning. I don't, I, a lot of people, you can get really far in your career without paying for training. But then you get to a certain point where if you want to be, a serious like master level on something, then you're going to have to invest by the time that you get to that point. And I say that too, because I had to pay when, by the time that I got to that point in my career, went out to Microsoft for three weeks, the whole nine yards. And, you know, you, you can learn a lot without ever uh, paying somebody else or trying to learn on your own. Some of it is also time. It depends on how much time you have uh, in order to learn. Mm. Um, Savish, Savish Nab says, let's switch over here to this one. Um, <laughs> Scott DBA, that's awesome. That's great. Um, uh, Savish Nab says, any suggestions on how to learn, how to use what we learn in fundamentals classes when my day job doesn't include that deep kind of work? I just write select statements and make reports. So um, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I got my start as a developer and gradually segued into database administration as well. The thing that I'll tell you is, in your office, stand next to the most expensive thing. Stand next to the most expensive thing and wait for that to break. So if you do that and you're helpful and volunteer and you offer to take responsibility and you offer to be on the hook when the thing breaks, like I'm going to try and go fix it if, any, if anyone else wants, but and I'm going to take all the blame. If I do something wrong, I'll totally take the blame, but let me go see. I'm going to take a risk personally. Is that cool with y'all? Bosses will love you for that because then often they don't have to pay to hire someone else from the outside or someone good. They can settle for someone incompetent like yourself. Uh, but that's how you learn and grow your career. Go stand next to the thing that's the most expensive, wait for it to break, and then that's how you gain experience. That's how your boss starts to trust you more and then give you more permanent responsibilities. Like then the next time that it breaks, even if you're not standing around it, your boss will come to you and say, oh, uh, so-and-so <laughs> feels personally attacked. Uh, so-and-so was really responsible and took ownership of this. Let's bring them back in. And I'll also tell you that through my career, that's also made executives come to me and say, when I was a database administrator, they would say, Brent, I know you're, you're the database administrator and you don't really do VMware or you don't really do fiber optics, but we have a problem that it's, it's worth a lot of money to us internally. You know, we're getting ready to spend a whole lot. We have this, there's smoke coming out of it, whatever. You seem to be really good at Googling and fixing things that in a way that we can trust you with high value stuff can you go tackle this problem? And so then it just automatically snowballs in in your career. If you, if you 
focus on writing queries and writing crystal reports, there's never going to be a lot of money in that unless you go to teach others. So if you passionately love writing queries and crystal reports, start teaching it to other people, and then you too can drive a Porsche 911. Uh, all right, so uh, C.R. Dodia says, when is Pinal starting the live stream? Uh, he, uses, uh, he, does do, he has a bunch of 60-second videos he's been doing recently. He's done really short videos, and I love that because like all of us are trying different experiments to see how to make things uh, work. Darren Davis says, because of Microsoft's database costs, my company is pushing people to open source databases. Do you see that as well? I see not only that, but also cloud services that people will go, why would I pay money for uh, a full-time service somewhere when instead I can just pay Amazon or Azure for every time I want to use it, I just go and attack that thing, like serverless DynamoDB, for example. Um, I am seeing a lot of that, and where I'm seeing it is people are deciding to use the cheapest thing that accomplishes their goal rather than saying we have this expensive data fridge over in the corner, we got to use this all the time and nothing else. So um, I love it because it lets SQL Server just focus on the things that are relational data, which it's really good at, uh, and lets other kinds of data go to other places. Like key value storage and cache and geo stuff should never be in SQL Server to begin with. Malik says, what open database should we learn other than SQL? The one your company has, you know, whatever one your company has so that you can put it on your resume as you're doing it, that you have production experience. If your company isn't using any open source databases, I would start with Postgres. Uh, I would start with Postgres because it's easy to find all over the place. Azure has it, Amazon has it, Google has it, you can download apps that have it. Um, and there's a decent amount of training stuff out there because it's super mature. Um, if you're, but either that or MySQL, you're probably pretty well off. Your skills in SQL Server will translate well over to those things. Uh, Nuna Bunny said, my friend told me, I like that, that's pretty good, I like that. Uh, my friend told me that adding an identity column to a table variable, which is joined with many other tables, can help his query go fast. Any truth to that? Not really. Um, it's possible that your friend had two different query plans, one with the, the identity and one without, and for some other reason that helped their joins. But what I would just start is I would try a temp table first instead. Do a temp table and usually you'll see that that blows the table variable uh, things out of the, out of the uh, water. Um, I don't learn NoSQL, so I have no idea there. G East says, are there ways to improve performance for large XML fields bloating the database? Yes, get them out of the database. Uh, SQL Server is not a good place to store XML. Now, yes, Microsoft will be like, you should put everything in SQL Server. Put your files in here, your PDFs, your MP3 collection that you acquired legally. Wink, wink. Um, you know, of course, they're going to want to sell you to put everything in SQL Server because it costs $7,000 a core. As you run into performance problems, they start making more and more money off of you. So obviously, they want to put it in. Uh, back here, the rest of us who make money when it's fast, we go, why don't you put that in a place that's more, uh, uh, more uh, relatable, like a file server, uh, some kind of key value storage, a database that really specializes in uh, NoSQL. Edward the Tech Guy says, uh, Hi everyone, I already have one year experience in software development. Yay! Um, I want to know what I'll do in the future. What do I look like? Aunt, uh, Aunt Miss Cleo? Miss Cleo, that's what her name was. I like Miss Cleo. Hilarious. Um, but I want to know what I'll do in the future since I used to uh, learn programming language without knowing what to develop. I don't know if I should become an embedded developer, a security developer, or learn data science. Can you give me any advice on the future of these fields? So if you're a developer, um, you're all, you should always be okay as long as you listen to what the business wants. It's much less about the language that you use. It's much less about the framework that you use. And it's much more about, can you hear what the business wants and then build something that solves that pain? So go to the business people that you work with, like managers at your company, salespeople, people who seem to have a lot of money, uh, budgetary money type things, and just go, hey, can I talk with you for five minutes? What is it that you want to be able to do that you can't today? 
Like what's a thing that your department needs, but you don't have, or you don't know how to solve that problem. And maybe it's an application that you want that you can't afford to buy. Maybe it's a business problem that you have that you can't figure out how to solve. Um, but talk to the business people and figure out how to translate what they want into something that you can deliver. And if you can do that, it doesn't matter what programming language you're using, doesn't matter whether you're a data science person or a front end development person, whatever, you're a person who solves problems and the business always has money for that. Uh, for more about that, uh, look at Jonathan Stark. So Jonathan Stark. Jonathan Stark has a series of stuff about double your freelancing rate, and he really talks about how you can solve problems for businesses rather than trying to bill hourly as a, as a developer. Uh, Always Pink says, yesterday I had to copy a database from 2016 to 2008. You had to what? You had to what? 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 2008 is not even supported anymore. What we, it's 2020. Feels like it's been 2020 for a really, really long time. But yeah, no, you know. So that's like saying, um, how can I shoot myself in the foot with a double-barreled shotgun? Stop doing that. Uh, that is a bad, bad, bad idea. Uh, it says people reviewing data don't want to upgrade. I don't care if they don't want to upgrade. That's their problem. Go get a SQL Server Express Edition instance. Express Edition is totally free. They can then go connect to that and do whatever they want. But that is the end of that. Now, Express Edition does cap out at 10 gigs of data. But now if we're talking about something more than 10 gigs of data per database, moving the data around is going to suck really bad anyway. So just be like, yo, go connect to you know the appropriate version quarantine the database. Yeah, it would suck pretty bad. Um, Savish Nav says, uh, what's a better option from a performance standpoint, creating a view to suggest a report versus running the native SQL from a report layer? Um, the, uh, there's really no difference from a view as opposed to the native T-SQL. Views get a really bad rap from database administrators as if views themselves natively are a problem. They are not. So here's how to kind of prove it. <laughs> If you search for viewsitebrenozar.com, I have a blog post about this called Your Views Aren't the Problem, Your Code Is. Uh, and in there, I basically explain how I take the view code and I run it natively and I show you back and forth A and B that the views really aren't a problem at all, but the code that you put inside the view is. So I'm totally okay with people using views inside reporting tools. It kind of limits the surface area of what I have to break. So that's kind of cool. Um, Scott says, is it me or everything? Did everything go fuzzy? That is you. You need to put the mimosa down. We're not... Uh, <laughs> It's a little early in the morning for you to be drinking. Also, it's either that or your wife your is, uh, got her hands around your throat and she's like, get away from Twitch, stop watching TV. It's time for you to do some yard work. Caroline, oh, good to see you, Caroline. Uh, Caroline said, I created a computed com to avoid making a data type conversion, my query, but the query plan still gives me an implicit conversion warning. Should I be concerned? If, uh, so qu when you say query plan warning, if you do a conversion on the way out with a select, you'll get an implicit conversion warning that's fake, that, that doesn't actually hurt anything, and I'll show it to you. So if I go over here, I'm going to say select star from DBO users uh, where display name equals Brent Ozar. I'm also going to create an index. Uh, display almost did that on DBO users uh, display name. Hi, Alexi. How's it going? Are you the Alexi, Alexi and Isle of Man? I, I, I should probably say that slower. Isle of Man, just so that people don't get freaked out about what we're talking about there. Uh, the If I go down to the users table, and if I look at the contents of the display name data type, so the display name data type is an Envercare, Unicode, Envercare. 
if I pass in a ver care, so here's what Unicode looks like. Unicode looks like putting an N in the front. If I put the N in the front and I execute this, you'll notice it runs nearly instantaneously. SQL Server is able to do an index seek. It dive bombs directly into Brent Ozar and it reads the rows out. Hardly reads any rows, we're out of here. And you can tell that it hardly reads any rows because if I hover my mouse over this, look at number of rows read up here. We only read one row and we outputted one row. That's as efficient as it gets. Oh, wow, you actually moved to London. I saw your Instagram stuff that you kept showing London pictures and I didn't know if you were just visiting. I was like, damn, he visits a lot. Uh, you still work for the same company or do you move work for somebody else? That's awesome that you moved. I'm going to guess you worked for somebody else. Uh, now I want, now I'm going to have to go check in on you and go see what's going on. Um, so now, so that's got the N in it for Unicode. But if I take the N out and I execute it again, query still goes fast. I still get an index seek. And if I hover my mouse over here, what the, what the, what? It says scalar operator. Hold on a second here. I'm going to say option recompile just to make sure that I don't have a problem that's unrelated. Execute and then zoom in. Ye no. Okay, that's fine. Um, so it says index seek and I still only read one row. Okay, so far so good. But if I turn around and say select cast last access date as no get out of here congratulations oh that's awesome dude as date uh, as this is a date if i turn around and run that same query but i put a cast inside there and i go look at the execution plan oh that one's actually is a cast oh that one's not so bad i thought i was going to get a warning inside there let's do this declare uh last access date date select last access date equals last access date and then try that. What I'm looking for is to fire the false alarm about uh, implicit conversions. It's still not doing it. Oh, that's what happens when I try to write a demo on the fly. Um, okay, let's try if uh, that didn't work. Oh, I can do it as an Envercare. Envercare 100, that might do it. Yes, yes. Um, so in here, I get an implicit conversion warning. It says down here, if I hover my mouse over it, it says, warning, convert implicit may affect the cardinality estimate. And I'm like, what are you, smoking crack? That doesn't have anything to do with the cardinality estimate. I'm not searching by last access date. Last access date has nothing to do with how many rows I'm going to find. This is a known bug in SQL Server, this in Management Studio and in SQL Server itself, because SQL Server itself is throwing this error on the plan. So if your plan is doing that, is doing an implicit conversion, and it's because of what's coming out, you're fine. Now, it may also happen if I say, declare display name vercare 100 and then i say select star from users where display name equals at display name and i'll set this to brent ozar so here i'm passing in a different data type than what the uh, execution plan has if you hover your mouse over the index seek, you see an implicit conversion down here. Yeah, see, that's tough for me to see without seeing the actual execution plan. But the first thing that I would just say is, are you getting an index seek? And if you're getting an index seek and it's only reading the number of rows necessary to output, then you're totally okay. Uh, okay, so coming back over here. Um, on Twitch, Swamware asked, when you retire, will you also retire from streaming? The thing that I love, I'll switch over here. The thing that I love with streaming is that I can do it when I want to, uh, as opposed to, like right now I'm doing it on a scheduled basis, but I'm only doing it on a scheduled basis until mid-September. Starting in mid-September, I've got some weekend classes for folks who pay for the live class season passes. So I'll stop doing streaming then, and then I have the Black Friday rush. We do, a, our company does a big annual sale in November for Black Friday. 
Um, and uh, so after that, I'm probably not going to stream again because and not ever, but like not on a scheduled basis. And I'll just pop in and do it whenever I want to. I'm different than a lot of streamers like professional gaming Twitch type streamers, because I don't need to make a living from the streaming. I just kind of do it for fun when I'm working. Uh, so I'll still do it, but it'll be randomly and when I'm connected. I like to also travel a lot. And so as soon as we hit the road, like we're going to Iceland for three months in 2021, uh, t touch wood as long as I can get into the country again. Um, that's nothing about me personally. That's the coronavirus situation. It's not like I've been banned from Iceland, uh, but I wouldn't stream during that time either. Uh, Kenny says, how do you decide when to use select into versus insert into for temp tables? That is beyond what I can explain quickly. We do talk about that a little bit in mastering query tuning, um, but it is kind of beyond what I can demo quickly. Uh, Shibboleth says, are there any downsides or gotchas in changing a data type on a table? Yes, it sucks. It's going to be absolutely terrible. It's going to require a uh, lock on the table and rewrite the whole uh, table itself. Um, so the, the way to do it is search for Michael J. Swart, J. Swart batching. Uh, uh, Michael Swart has a really good series on 100% online deployments. I'm going to move this around just so that I can zoom into it. So if you search for Michael J. Swart online deployments, he has a great series on how you go about doing that. It's a lot of hard work, uh, requires a lot of prep and training, but it's that's how you go about doing it. Mm. Uh, Jesus says, do you have any tips to slow down queries without doing SP configure settings, changes, or dropping indexes? I'm trying to build some performance tuning test cases. Yes, write terrible queries. Uh, so there you go. Uh, next up, let's see here. Coming back over here. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh, Andy, good to see you too as well. I saw you earlier and I forgot to mention it because I was in the middle of something. Uh, have uh, fun out in the greenhouse and stay safe. Andy grows marijuana. He's unbelievable. Great marijuana. Really good stuff. He takes pride. I probably shouldn't say that on a webcast because I think it's pretty illegal where he lives, but I'm sure he won't get in trouble. I'm kidding. He does not grow weed. I'm not saying he doesn't smoke weed, but he definitely does not grow weed. He pays for it just like you and I do. It's so terrible. It's going in such a bad direction. Uh, let's see here. What else? There was another one up there. Maroon asked like a three paragraph long question. Um, how would you go about adding foreign keys? So for me, foreign keys aren't really wonderful uh, in terms of query performance. They're good for limiting bad data going into the database. But if you just search for query or for um, foreign keys on brainozar.com. Eric Darling wrote a great series about why they don't really help well in terms of performance and why they suck so bad to implement. So search for foreign keys on the blog and you'll get a big, huge, long uh, series of posts on there. Uh, Bandar says, I just replaced a UDF with string split, but my output is an int. Do you recommend casting as an int? So string split causes all kinds of other interesting problems. I would want to see what the execution plan was and see what your objective was and how you make it go fast. We actually talk about that kind of switch in the mastering query tuning class, but I really would have to see the execution plan to do that. Your next thought is going to be, Brent, how do I send you my execution plan? You go to brentozar.com and click consulting up at the top of the screen. It's one of those things that's kind of beyond the scope of what I can answer quickly. All right. Well, along with Andy, I am also going to go out, although I am not going to go out and work on my weed. My weed is doing just fine. Doesn't need any attention today. Instead, I am just going to go down and go get some coffee uh, down from my local coffee shop. And then I'm going to go sit out on the balcony because I have a nice day off here. Um, here, I don't have any weekend emergency clients. This is the first weekend in three or four weekends straight that I haven't had an emergency client. I'm just ecstatic. Um, and I'm also ecstatic because when I do emergency clients, my wife actually gets all of the money. Our agreement is whenever we do and uh, whenever I work weekends, that means I have to cancel the things that I'm doing with her on the weekend and I have to work with clients instead. If my wife passed away, heaven forbid, I would work 24 seven because I absolutely love what I do. Um, but so I don't so on other ways so to make sure that I don't work on the weekends. I uh, give her all the money, and so then she's okay if I actually work weekends. Um, no breakfast nachos today. The nachos place doesn't open until like 9 a.m., I think. 
I think it's 9 a.m. that the nachos place opens, but um, I'll probably, we may push that for later. We were really bad yesterday. We had a bunch of Mai Tais and fish and a chocolate lava cake at this Hawaiian place down near us on the, on the marina. So Curly Bracket AI, welcome to the club. Um, so if you want to get alerted whenever I stream, because I probably will be streaming Monday and Friday, just I'm not going to know the times in advance. It's going to depend on how my client gig works. If you want to know when I'm streaming, if you subscribe to me on Twitch or YouTube, hit the subscribe button, the follow button, whatever, uh, and then you'll get an email whenever I go live streaming. You And I always go live like five minutes in advance so that that way you can get the email and then stumble in if you want to. So thanks everybody for hanging out, and I will We'll see y'all later this week. Adios, folks.